Welcome to another episode of The Warning Woods. If you enjoy the podcast, please consider giving it five stars and writing a review. Reviews help spread the podcast to more listeners. If you want more creepy content, follow me on Instagram and TikTok at The Warning Woods. I'm Miles Tridal, and this story is called The Dive. I always said if I got rich, I'd use the money to buy experiences rather than things. It had always been a speculative comment, dinner table jabber. I never expected to actually have any notable wealth, but life is unpredictable. You never know when the public will latch on to something you create and elevate it far beyond its worth. For me, that something is called the Snappy Turtle app. It's a stupid game anyone can play on their phone. All you have to do is tap the screen to make the cartoon turtle jump out and catch fish passing by. I developed it with my friend Brett as a class project, and, well, it took on a life of its own. The Snappy Turtle explosion happened about a year ago. Good Morning America ran a segment discussing the dangers of my addictive game for children. I thought that was the end for the game, but the broadcast sent downloads and sales through the roof. A few months later, a friend reminded me what I used to say about getting rich, so I made a list of places I wanted to go, things I wanted to see, stuff I wanted to do, and tacked it onto the corkboard in my studio apartment. Item number one, something I'd wanted to try since I was a little kid watching Shark Week, was deep sea diving. I took Brett, who had also become my business partner, and we drove down to the tip of Florida. We had an appointment with a guy Brett found online. The man promised a shortcut to every diver's dream. This guy charged a heap more than the others in the area, so Brett might have just passed him over, but the tagline had gotten him curious. Through some emails with the guide, Brett discovered what he meant by every diver's dream. We signed up immediately. We met the guide, whose name I'm intentionally leaving out of this for reasons that will be clear later, at the dock. He told us to look for his boat, the gray gander, and wait for him on board. I gave Brett a suspicious glance when we first laid eyes on the gray gander bobbing near the dock. I know nothing about boats, but I know a thing or two about cleanliness. I just hoped our guide cared more about the vessel's functionality and safety than its appearance. Brett and I were about to step onto the boat when a gruff voice behind us shouted, Hey, what are you doing on my boat? I whirled around with my hands raised in apologetic innocence. A grubby-looking man with a long gray beard stood just behind us with his hands on his hips. Brett and I both stammered, trying to tell him we were his customers. But the man flashed a smile, toothy in shape, but not so much in content. I'm just pulling your legs, he said with a friendlier tone. We laughed nervously, and he crumpled into a pulsating heap of laughter. He literally slapped his knees as he doubled over at his own bad joke. His laughter transformed into a violent cough, and once he regained control of himself, he straightened up. Let's get going then, he said, matter-of-factly. He walked between us. After he passed, I whispered to Brett, Are you sure about this guy? He seemed professional online, Brett answered. Neither of us had it in us to break off our agreement with the man, so we followed him on board. He tossed us a couple of sun-faded orange life jackets and said we would put on the real gear once we reached our destination. About how long will that take? I asked. Oh, no more than a toot and a whistle, he replied. To this day, I don't know what that means, but if it's slang for 15 minutes, his estimation was spot on. The guide retrieved the diving gear and showed us how to use it all. I asked if he would be joining us, to which he responded that his diving days were far behind him. Brett and I exchanged glances again. There we were, floating out on the ocean, about to dive dozens of feet below the surface with a guide who couldn't be bothered to join us. The guide caught our concerned looks. Oh, you're gonna be fine, trust me. I'll attach you to these lines here, he said, picking up a couple of cables from the boat's deck. I'll hook them up to you so I can yank you up if you run into trouble. We still must have looked as nervous as we felt because he smiled wide and said, just enjoy yourselves. That's what you came all this way for, innit? It was. Every diver's dream was just a handful of meters below us. As uncomfortable as our guide made us feel, it didn't change our desire to explore. 
The crusty guide sang a sea shanty as Brett and I donned the diving gear he provided. Within minutes, we were perched on the side of the boat, ready to dive. When you hit the water, just flipper yourself straight down. She'll be waiting for you, said the guide. He gave us a thumbs up, and we rolled off the boat into the dark, cold waters of the Atlantic. It took my eyes a few minutes to adjust. Even in the glow of my headlamp, the restless water near the surface allowed limited visibility. I followed the guide's instructions and swam straight down. Once I put some distance between myself and the wavy surface, the water cleared up beautifully. I suddenly found myself in a vast expanse of blackish blue that went on forever. Brett caught up to me and seemed to get lost in the magnitude of the ocean as well. After maybe 30 seconds that felt much longer, I remembered what we were doing down there in the first place. I upended myself to search along the ocean floor. Brett copied me. Our quarry wasn't hard to find. It was really too big to miss. Brett and I swam towards it as fast as our flippered feet would allow. Every diver's dream. A pirate shipwreck. The ship must have been resting there for hundreds of years. Most of the bow had been eaten away by time and microscopic sea life. Thick moss and barnacles clung to every inch that remained. Amazingly, the deck had stayed mostly intact. I scanned its surface, imagining the antics that had taken place upon it. Had there been any wild sword battles like you see in the movies? Had they executed hostages there when their victims couldn't pay up? I couldn't stop smiling as I examined the spooky bit of history below me. Two impressive masts still stood erect on the old ship. The sails had long since rotted away, but I could imagine them filling with wind and speeding the demon ship towards its unfortunate victims. I shivered at the thought of being aboard some civilian merchant ship and seeing that wicked thing approaching through the fog. Lost in daydreams, I hadn't noticed Brett swimming past me. I saw him swimming along the starboard side and moved to join him. I almost couldn't believe my eyes when we found an iron cannon protruding from a small window. I wondered how many people had stared down its narrow mouth, now filled with slick green growth, in their very last moment of life. We swam up and over the deck. Brett pretended to stand on it, making me laugh but also making me realize the sheer size of the ship. He looked tiny standing next to the enormous center mast. I turned away to swim up to the poop deck, but something else caught my eye. The perfect shape of a square blighted the otherwise uninterrupted growth on the deck. I felt along the square until I found what I hoped to find. A latch. I waved Brett over and braced my feet on the deck. Together, we pulled the trap door free from the thick, mossy growth. There was a brittle crack as it came up, and I nearly vomited into my regulator when I saw why. As the trap door fell away, a bony hand remained attached to it. Brett shined his light down the hole, and we watched as the arm it had been attached to slipped into the darkness below. We hovered above the trap door for some time after that, unsure if we wanted to continue. Brett grabbed my shoulder as if to say, let's do this together. I gave him a quick nod, and he flipped over to swim below. The opening was only large enough for one of us to swim through at a time, but I stayed right behind him. What I was so afraid of at that point is a mystery to me. My fear must have been coming from some primal instinct, a sixth sense maybe, because I never could have known what nightmares awaited us below the deck of that old ship. We came face to face with the crumpled remains of the sailor who had gone down clutching the trap door, maybe in a last ditch effort to get above deck as the ship filled with water. He had probably remained there for centuries, he may never have moved had Brett and I not opened the door. Now he lay on the floor, seaweed swaying on his bones like ragged clothes in the dark water. My light shone straight into the empty sockets he once saw the world through. I forced myself to put the unfortunate man behind me and swam further into the darkness. I had to consciously control my breathing as I wanted to draw rapid shallow breaths to match the rising pace of my heart. I knew if I wasn't careful, I would consume my oxygen before we could escape the bowels of the ship. I dreaded the thought of getting caught against some jagged boards as Captain Wacko tried to pull me up to the surface by the cable wrapped around my waist. The corner of a table appeared at the edge of my headlamp's glow. I turned my head to investigate. 
The sturdy table had somehow remained upright when the ship went down, and so did the two men whose corpses were seated across from one another. They were in similar condition as the first skeleton we'd come across, but these two disturbed me far more. Each one held a hand of cards. The remainder of the deck sat neatly sacked before them in the center of the table. The cards were clearly from another time, but had mysteriously stayed intact beneath the water. I'm still haunted by the image of the shadows these dead men cast on the wall behind them. In the shadows, they might have still been alive and engaged in a solemn game. How they could be there, still in their seats, upright and clutching those cards, is a question unsolvable by the known sciences. The impossibility of it all should have made me turn around right then and there, but after Brett had taken a minute to absorb the sight too, we pressed on. We stayed close together, but cast our lights in wide angles to catch anything worthy of attention. I made the mistake of looking sideways while swimming forward and bumped into a wall. It surprised me. I didn't think we could have reached the stern yet. Brett tapped my shoulder and shone his light on a door further down the wall. There was some kind of room on the other side. By now, the creepy feeling I had from the card table had faded, and at the sight of the door, I became excited. Brett tapped my shoulder again and pointed to his oxygen gauge. We were doing fine, but I understood his point. We needed to look around quickly and get back to the surface. With that in mind, I gave the door a tug. Brett shone his light into the room and we both froze, quietly holding our breath. Over a dozen full skeletons floated throughout the room. Unlike the men at the card table, these corpses were freely drifting eternally listless, lost souls. Brett looked my way, accidentally shining his light through my mask and blinding me. He saw me wince and turned away. I heard his muffled voice make a sound sort of like a grunt, or maybe a scream. I still couldn't see. Blurred shapes rushed around me in the white filter that had covered my eyes. I squeezed my eyelids, trying to clear my vision. When I opened them again, I screamed too. All of the skeletons that had been floating around the back room were now standing before me. Every one of their skulls, all their empty eyes, were turned in my direction. Brett was gone. I couldn't take my light off the skeleton crew, so I just hoped he was already on his way back to the trap door. Slowly, I pushed the door closed. Just before I sealed it shut, I swear I saw one skull's jaw drop open in a silent cry. Something bumped against the door on the other side. I swam like an Olympian. I wanted to put as much distance as I could between myself and that door before it... I don't know. Before it opened and the dead came after me, I guess. I kept hoping to see Brett's flippers ahead of me. He had to be up there, I told myself. I would have seen his cable if he had gone into the room instead of turning back. Passing the card players renewed my fear. They had each turned their heads my way. They still held their cards, but their focus was not on the game. It was on me. I gave them a wide berth and pressed on. I found some relief when I finally caught up to Brett, but it didn't last. He had his light trained on the trap door, which was now closed. The man who had been clutching it when we opened it seemed to be waiting for us on the stairs. Just as the others had, his skull faced us and his hollow eye sockets bore into our full ones. Brett moved first, catching me by surprise. By the time I realized what was happening, he had grabbed the skeleton by the shoulders and pushed him off the staircase. I quickly recovered and grabbed the trapdoor's handle. Thankfully, it opened easily. I turned to make sure Brett was behind me just as something tugged at my waist. Suddenly, I was no longer in control. I got helplessly dragged away from the door, away from the ship, and up toward the surface. I couldn't see Brett. As soon as my head broke above the water, I ripped off my regulator and started shouting at the guide, Brett, pull up my friend, pull him up. The guide responded with a friendly smile and a lazy wave and moved over to the second winch. He started to bring in Brett's line as I climbed aboard. I was sitting on the deck, removing my flippers, when the winch's motor switched from a low whirr to a high whining sound. Something wet slapped against the deck again and again. 
The severed end of a cable had come up and now spun around and around on the winch. The guide just stared at it, dumbstruck. Where is he? I demanded. The man didn't respond, not even with a shrug. I started to put my flippers back on. I had to go back and bring Brett up. No, the guide shouted. You can't go back. You don't know what did that to him. Well, I can't just leave him down there, I replied. You don't have the air to go down there, he said. I had had it with his excuses. I said, then get me another tank. There are no more tanks. You took my only two. We called the Coast Guard while we waited for Brett to surface. He never did. The Coast Guard searched, but by the time they had gotten to our location, we all knew Brett would have long since depleted his oxygen. They were unable to recover his body. I asked them if they had searched within the shipwreck at the bottom and received pitying looks in response. Trust me, we did everything we could. I'm sorry for your loss, one of them said. I noticed the guide behind them, watching the exchange with nervous apprehension. Hopefully the truth will come out in court, but for now, I'm stuck wondering exactly what happened that day. Why had the guide taken us out to that ship? Why was the Coast Guard so reluctant to search it? At night, when I'm tired and irrational, I wonder if they hadn't acknowledged the shipwreck because they didn't see it. Maybe it wasn't there anymore. Whatever his motivations, maybe the guide had taken us there as some kind of sacrifice. Maybe he acted as a sort of macabre recruiter for the skeletal army below. These are questions to which I may never have answers, but if I have to, I'll go to my grave searching for them.